this training, we'll start with the electrical grid, understanding the challenges of a utility, and then we'll talk about the communication in the grid and how the protocols assist all the communication and how substation automation is a key part of the electrical grid. And uh, we'll close with uh, a discussion on automation or possible automation applications in various types of substations. As you can see, the utilities have bigger challenges uh, managing the power uh, from the generation all the way to the residential and uh, commercial industrial consumer. Um, there is many uh, requirements in place from wide area adaptive protection schemes, energy management systems, uh, large scale generation, uh, different type of generations, uh, storage generation, um, and then uh, you've got the wide area monitoring and control systems and uh, distributed energy resources management microgrids. All of this require the utility to face the greater challenges uh, being the asset optimization, transmission optimization, distribution optimization, workforce and engineering design and optimization smart meter and communication, and finally demand optimization. Just to give you an idea of how power is delivered from a generation point to the load or the uh, end user, um, basically it starts at 69 kV and then at the transmission uh, uh, criteria, it would be 765, just above the 100 kV. Distribution would be just under the 100 kV. So in this case, we're giving an example of 26 and 69 kV. And then you've got the customers, uh, basically the industrial and the commercial, they might consume power depending on their requirements, uh, either at 13 kV or 4 kV. And uh, then the end user residential would consume the power at the 120 volts, 240 volts. As you can see, this is the electrical grid. And in this electrical grid, it's from generation all the way to the three consumers, the, the industrial, commercial, and residential. And in uh, the delivery of the power, we've got a very important communication infrastructure that would allow the information to flow from the end users, from the substations, back to the management systems. <clears throat> and the management systems can issue controls back to the substations or the generation substations and these remote controls would also have to be monitored and coordinated with other control centers in order to uh, make sure that no failure takes place in the delivery of power and the power is delivered with full efficiency back to the end consumer. Now that we understand that there is data that has to travel from uh, the the grid back to the management systems, uh, we really need to understand what kind of data or how can we classify the data that comes back from the grid back to the, to the management systems. So the first type is the SCADA type and that could be operational and non-operational and situational awareness data. Uh, there is raw real-time calculated data. Um, the target application could be um, either an outage management system, an energy management system, a distribution management system, um, okay? And the source application uh, could be either coming from a SCADA, from a protection, from a digital fault recorder, a change of state, a sequence of event uh, recorder, um, metering and diagnostics applications. If we take that a step further, the, the finest uh, data that can be collected is the five types of data, which is digital input, analog input, digital output, analog output, and counters or accumulators. That's how we convert the data from the primary equipment, the breakers, the transformers, um, the switch gear into one of these five types that then get converted into a protocol that get communicated back to the management systems. So what is automation? 
Automation is the deployment of substation and feeder operating functions and applications ranging from SCADA and alarm processing to volt var control in order to optimize the management of capital assets and enhance operation and maintenance efficiencies with minimal human intervention. The idea is to collect the data by the utility utilizing substation automation from the IEDs or the primary equipment in the field. Um, if we would like to take a view at the data flow from the substations back to the management systems, um, so this way we're not looking at the load but we're just focusing on looking at the data uh, flow. Uh, what you will find is for any utility there will be remote substations and there will be local substations. Local substations are in close proximity of the control center. Remote substations are very far from the control center, sometimes in a very remote area like a mountain um, and reaching it is not as easy as the local substations. And uh, the, for the remote ones, they would have to rely on uh, different uh, different media for transmitting of data. It could be a radio uh, pole, it could be um, a special uh, phone line. Uh, yet the local, uh, they can just connect to the local area network. And then either the operator or the engineer at the management system can have access to the data. Uh, the operator main job is to keep monitoring the data and in case of uh, requirement for a dispatch he would send a dispatch or he would dispatch an engineer or a field service person to the site. Um, the engineer job is to keep working on the design and the configuration of most of the devices that are in the substation. So from a data flow or a communication flow, it goes from the primary equipment to the IEDs uh, to the RTUs. Most of these uh, equipments would be located inside the RTUs. And sometimes some of it will be located in a controlled environment. Some of it will not be, con be contained in a controlled environment. For example, the primary equipment, the IEDs might be sitting in the switchgear uh, or the switchyard. And, and that switchyard may not be inside the building. It might be just sitting outside. Nevertheless, the, the, the RTUs, the, the recorders, uh, these days are, are being put inside a, a control room and that control room is environmentally controlled and there is air conditioning and heating systems in order to make sure that these systems do not, uh, are not exposed to uh, intense environmental uh, setups. Um, the, the RTUs would communicate back over a specific communication lines like we've seen uh, in the previous uh, slide to uh, a control center. And that control center could be in close proximity or in a very remote proximity. So what are the advantages of automation for a utility? Um, the advantage of automation is to facilitate remote monitoring and control by operators and engineers facilitate fast processing of substation data, efficient asset utilization which decrease the capital cost and minimize the maintenance cost, um, reduced wiring cost and advanced IEDs uh, utilizing merging units, and improved data summarization examples alarm grouping. Uh, what is the return on, on investment uh, story? Beside the simple advantage of system protection or SCADA, uh, remote monitoring would translate into constant grid availability, constant power availability to the end user, uh, minimize the loss and waste of power. In this section, we will talk about the communication and the data communication in a grid. Pure communication without any automation applications uh, would involve a lot of uh, primary equipment in the substation and a lot of uh, specialized equipment in the substation. Um, for example, uh, what is the communication requirement in a substation would involve SCADA information, mobile data hotspot setup, video, card reader, remote access, historical files, lost communication to external devices, peripheral devices status, and power line carrier status. 
um, all of these uh, devices would require remote monitoring otherwise there will be local monitoring which is superbly expensive so uh, remote monitoring can only be facilitated with uh, automation systems so communication can take place uh, with two uh, in two major parts first we've got the hardware part second we've got the software we'll try to discuss each one of these separately Communication hardware. Uh, so we've got the serial, which can be either RS-232, RS-485, uh, RS-422, or any of the old communication um, allowing protocols. Now these are phasing out and it's being replaced by network communication. Network communication could be fiber or copper, um, but it relies on the ethernet and the fast uh, communication bus uh, utilization. It also can be done using a radio, a least line, uh, modem, multiplexer in the substation, and uh, recently voice over IP is taking place. Uh, all of these uh, basically increase the demand of advanced automation devices in your substation. When we talk communication protocols, um, something that uh, a lot of people in our industry are not aware of is that communication protocols started in a very proprietary manner uh, where every uh, vendor, every uh, uh, student in a university decided that he wants to create a specific communication protocol because it's the most efficient. And at that time, in the 1980s, the infrastructure, the physical uh, physical. Uh, capabilities were very low so you've got the 1200 baud rate modems and the 600 baud rate modems um, which would allow you to transmit 600 bits per second very minimal so in order to utilize this communication very efficiently protocols were uh, very simple and were relying on the idea of tagging so uh, a value in the field like a transformer temperature or a breaker status would be tagged uh, with uh, digital input number 25. So when they say digital input number 25 is on, that uh, means that the breaker is open. Digital input number 25 is off, that means the breaker is closed. And um, uh, the protocols to communicate this digital input status, analog input status, uh, digital output status, analog output status, and controls uh, would include uh, some of the older protocols, Harris, Conatel, LNG, 8979, Modbus. Um, these protocols are uh, proprietary protocols, and there is hundreds, maybe thousands of these protocols around, not only in the electrical industry, but also in other industries like um, uh, the water industry, all the other industries. Now, these protocols became uh, a little bit of a burden and nevertheless, thousands and thousands of devices were installed in the field with these protocols. Some people might argue the Modbus protocol may not be a proprietary protocol um, because it's the most uh, common protocol uh, in some areas. Uh, well. The, the reality of the matter is there isn't uh, a body or an organization that would certify you for a Modbus protocol. You can create any device, claim that it talks Modbus, and uh, unless it talks with another device that's Modbus, that talks also Modbus, you're not sure that the Modbus implementation was proper, and there is no such a thing. So came along the IEC 6870-5-101, 103, and 104, and the DMP protocols. And both protocols were based on uh, making sure that anybody who claims that he can talk DMP and IEC 6870-5, um, that they get certifications. Nevertheless, it was still using the older idea of tagging the information and distributing the information based on a poll. Um, in the 1990s, the, the idea of uh, taking these protocols a step ahead and instead of having a protocol, have a system. And the system is like the universal communication architecture or um, the 61850. Both of them rely on a different kind of communication. So instead of relying on a poll and a reply, they would rely on 
publisher and subscriber so a publisher would send data constantly after the handshake and the subscriber would receive this data and parse this data for the required subset of data information that he requires. Um, this minimized and more efficiently used the network communication. So as we move more and more toward network, as we move more and more toward systems, the older proprietary and open protocols are being phased out. Saying that, um, there is a lot of arguments that the DMP protocol is still a, a very strong and viable protocol and a very uh, uh, cost efficient to be used in the substations and the IEC 101, 103, 104 is also cost efficient in the substations. So when we say that they're being phased out, uh, we're talking about uh, 20, maybe 30 years uh, before we see a full uh, implementation of uh, system protocols like synchrophasers uh, 61850 uh, which is the advent of the UCA finally uh, we'll discuss automation logic so we, we discussed communication in the in the grid uh, we discussed the hardware and software and last we will discuss about automation automation sometimes can be misinterpreted as just delivering SCADA information. That's true. Uh, it also could mean that we could implement some logic in the substation to allow for self-healing, to allow for uh, automated um, uh, tasks to be carried out. So one remote uh, request from uh, the, the, the main or the energy management system could translate into 20 or 30 logical steps inside the substation and uh, the, those 20 or 30 logical steps would be taken by, by the local uh, devices. If I would like to categorize the automation, um, we would categorize by the type of the substation. So, for example, We'll start our first category with a automation in a generation, transmission, and feeder automation. Um, and then uh, the next type of substations uh, would be a distribution automation application, an AC monitoring uh, automation, communication monitoring uh, for loss of communication, for example, data logging and data storage and historians applications, data reduction and summarizing application, and data conversion uh, application. Um, there is a lot of automation that took place over the years and this automation is common to all the substations. Um, there is also non-common automation that took place by local substations and can be built using uh, programmable logical controllers, PLCs, and these, uh, these PLCs have the capability of building any logic for uh, automation that would serve the need of the utility. We'll discuss only the major types of automation based on uh, the, the automation subcategory. The first application that we will discuss for uh, generation transmission uh, and feeder bay automation application is the automatic voltage control, the AVC. Uh, the automatic voltage control uh, is a sophisticated application that automatically monitors and controls groups of transformers to maintain a steady level of voltage based on a user-defined targets and settings. Uh, the automatic tap change control mechanism provides an automatic load balancing across the connected transformers and predictive algorithms to define the uh, level tap effect uh, before the tap takes place, the tap change takes place. Uh, bus bar connections are continuously monitored for dynamic uh, reaction to changes in switching arrangements. Uh, tertiary reactors connections are automatically monitored and considered when predictive voltage changes due to low voltage transformer control whenever needed. Uh, the next uh, example that we will discuss is the breaker uh, failure protection. So a breaker failure protection is when an overcurrent fault occurs on a feeder. The first line of defense is of course the overcurrent uh, protection relay. These relays detect the overcurrent and trip the breakers. 
that supply the feeder from the bus. In the case that the protection relays fail to trip the circuit breakers or the circuit breaker itself malfunction, the continued fault current can cause damage to the bus and other upstream devices. To guard against this scenario, this application is used to trip the breakers even further upstream to de-energize the entire bus. To ensure consistent reaction times to all protection trip sources, all trip events generated by protection devices are both generated at the same time in the tripping process. So this is a protection that's implemented at the automation level uh, as a backup to the protection level. Uh, another application that uh, we can implement in the autom at the automation level as a backup to the uh, protection level is the definite time uh, protection. Overcurrent uh, protection observes the current magnitude in an electrical circuit and sends a control signals to the field equipment when the, they exceed the configured limits. The time delay between detecting an overcurrent condition and Executing the control signal depends on the overcurrent magnitude. In all inverse time overcurrent protection schemes, the time delay relates to the current in a smooth curve. Uh, definite time overcurrent protection is a simpler scheme where the time delay relates to the current in a step curve. The synchronism application controls breaker closure based on a voltage condition on either side of the breaker. The DTA monitors the voltage on both the bus and the line side of the breaker and when the conditions of phase differences, slip frequency and root mean square uh, RMS voltage uh, difference are within configured limits, it closes the breaker. In any bay, or a, a feeder bay, you might find a local physical local remote switch. Uh, an application, a soft local remote switch application, uh, provides a custom local remote enabling or disabling of substation control relays at the distributed sites. A master local remote switch located within the data concentrator RTU will control uh, the enabling and disabling of the local remote switch uh, function at the distributed sites. When the master local remote switch is in local mode position, the data concentrator or the RTU, remote terminal unit, and all distributed units will be switched to local mode, hence disabling all control functions at the data concentrator, RTU, and all distributed units. When the local remote switch is in remote pos mode position, the data concentrator, RTU, and all distributed units will be switched to remote mode, hence enabling all control functions to be performed normally at the data concentrator RTU and all the distributed units. The secondary master trip close is an added security. So the secondary master trip close application translates a control request into a conventional trip close operation in conjunction with an additional control request to operate a secondary master trip or closed relay for added uh, control security. Uh, set point adjustment, uh, when we say the word set point, we mean analog outputs. And the way analog outputs versus analog inputs where you're monitoring analogs versus sending analogs, uh, sometimes what you need to do is you will receive a digital output from a SCADA master station. And then you would use this uh, set point adjustment application to vary the value of an analog output set point. It basically derives the output adjustment values for a set point from a duration of a digital output and the value of an analog input, which is measured values of the current set points. The final two applications that I will talk about is the automatic pole position indication and automatic load restoration. Uh, sorry, the tap position indication and the automatic load restoration. The tap position indication is basically uh, the transformer uh, tap position indication application translates uh, the digital input values into an analog input uh, value for monitoring the tap position with a magnitude defined 
in a configurable table uh, this will allow us to look at the the tab and then uh, monitor the tab over a period of time uh, automatic load restoration uh, it means that we take uh, certain uh, values um, uh, around the bus bar and if we see a failure uh, we can self heal or automatically uh, fix the the load to a redundant uh, bus uh, as such the 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 load is never is never lost and it's uh, restored um, that will be it for uh, discussing uh, applications in a generation transmission feeder bay automation application of course there is uh, many more than uh, the ones that we have just discussed uh, but uh, we will we will you can implement those either in a plc or in a what we call a logic application that will allow you to build your ladder logic in a substation we're done with the uh, feeder and transmission uh, uh, applications let's talk about distribution applications so distribution applications uh, there is many this is a heavy field where uh, distribute where uh, automation have taken uh, a lot of uh, applications and uh, we'll talk about a subset of them so the, the first one we'll talk about is the auto reclose of course there is auto reclosers where their main function is just to do auto reclosing uh, in the field but uh, let's say there is an application that you can build that will allow you to do auto reclosing the automatic reclose application can automatically reclose trip circuit breaker allowing the power system to recover from a momentary fault the automatic reclose uh, support multiple automatic reclose function each automatic reclose function supports a configurable number of reclose attempts uh, each with individual configurable dead times and reclaim times uh, each automatic reclose function can support uh, multiple trigger status inputs to indicate the protection has operated and the automatic reclose function should be initially initiated um, so when uh, the dead time is the time between the detection of the circuit breaker trip and the automatic reclosing of the circuit breaker uh, the reclaim time is the time following the circuit breaker being reclosed uh, during which time a further opening is considered to be part of the current reclose operation so um, uh, the, the common uh, stories in the field is a branch falling on a, a wire or uh, uh, any any uh, animal uh, uh, shorting uh, phases and stuff like that so basically um, this these applications can look for a certain uh, primary equipment signals digital inputs digital outputs uh, analog inputs and then based on these values uh, they would of course uh, cause uh, that time which is the time uh, of circuit breaker trip and the automation recloser of the circuit breaker uh, reclosing to check that the uh, protection uh, status has been uh, achieved the automatic restoration is ideal for uh, commercial for large commercial and or, or industrial facilities that rely on a constant power supply uh, the auto restoration scheme can reduce the outage to less than a minute um, the pet, this uh, load transfer uh, scheme automatically locate and isolate fault on a feeder qualifies the ability to restore load based on a substation and feeder data then quickly restore power to uh, faulted sections by supplying uh, power from another source uh, the system operators are kept informed of the switching operations um, auto restoration can support multiple seasons maybe you need uh, certain settings on a certain season uh, certain sources to be used in one season and another sources to be used in a different uh, season based on your commercial use uh, in a in a mall or in a in an industrial uh, location um, so uh, those complex feeder topologies are being handled by such an application um, the distribution co capacitor control algorithms are uh, basically algorithms that uh, support 
uh, the more efficient use of already installed banks to improve the control of your distribution capacitors by coordinating capacitors based on the needs of the high side of the distribution substation transformer. Uh, as the power factor of the system is improved, the total current flow will be reduced and losses will be reduced. Uh, this permits additional load to be served by the same system, holding the system closer to uh, unity power factor also increases the system reliability. Typical payback uh, for the system is less than two years. Um, in addition, the system automatically alarms for blown fuses on a capacitor banks, uh, saving many utility worker hours and checking uh, for these uh, blown fuses. Fault localization is uh, big job in distribution automation. What you want to achieve is to um, localize your fault in seconds, not hours, and greatly reduce the outage times. Um, the fault localization application uh, can be com is a configured software uh, that provides fault detection, location, and graphically animate the information uh, within an HMI. In a typical system, the fault localization application will query information retrieved from remote feeders, IEDs, uh, con concerning uh, fault detection to determine the state of a particular power distribution network. Uh, the application uh, would maintain an updated state of the entire distribution network. Uh, this would allow the information to be accessed by the users through the HMI, of course, and visually determine the condition of the distribution network and make it easier to locate uh, the, the faulty uh, sections in seconds or less uh, instead of leaving the, the end user without power for hours. Uh, when we were discussing the types of uh, uh, layouts of a substation, um, there is a load and dead bus. So you have a, one of the applications, of course, in automation would be a load and dead bus transfer application, which works to maintain a system efficient by monitoring the network of substations and moving load off the uh, overloaded transformer to other stations in an electrical network as required. The application detects a transformer that reaches a predetermined overload uh, set point so that that would be pre-configured about uh, that transformer then transfer the loads to a station that have the unused capacity the application also automatically attempts to restore power to feeders that lose their primary supply uh, in the station um, the operator can set a routine to confirm the switching operations prior to the execution or to be in full automation mode. Uh, load transfer is a proven way to postpone uh, construction of new substations by reducing the overload on existing substations. As such, lowering uh, the, the capital expenditures. The load shedding curtailment application basically uh, works with the breakers, feeders, and define uh, what we call curtailment zones. And these are zones that can be shed off, that they're not sensitive, that can be taken out of uh, uh, the load on the grid uh, until such time that the operator or the master decides to put back that load back onto the grid when uh, the, the grid is uh, stable and can take that extra load. Sometimes uh, you cannot just shift the load to a different uh, source because all the sources are overloaded as such you would have to basically shed off that load and that's what a, a load shedding or curtailment application does. It basically takes out an entire zone or a, a, an area out of power in order to minimize the load on the entire uh, grid. 
and uh, only the operator master can uh, gradually add that load or these zones as as the load on the entire grid starts to stabilize um, hopefully this was a good introduction to distribution automation applications uh, of course like in the other applications that i discussed uh, if there is any other need it can be uh, implemented in uh, programmable logical controllers or logic applications an application that you will find in generation, distribution, and uh, transmission substations is the AC analog alarm application. Uh, this application basically will be used in order to monitor AC values. Once the AC value exceeds a value, a certain pre-configured value, or go under a pre-configured value, uh, an alarm will be raised and uh, either the operator or it will uh, start a, a sequence of events in in the in a programmable logic uh, that that will allow the 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 operator or the events to fix the the status or go back to the normal status of the uh, substation another application in the ac monitoring is the ac data profiling so ac data profiling means that we capture an ac analog information probably an ac analog input information uh, over a period of time and we generate a com trade file uh, com trade file is basically an i triple e standard 37.111 uh, and uh, basically this uh, file would be uh, produced uh, using analog input values that are reported by a digital signal processor and the digital data can be uh, any digital input available in your uh, database or from any of your primary uh, equipment um, the ac data profiling normally can capture um, would say about 100 200 uh, ac analogs and a couple of digital analog digital inputs um, and uh, the recording and the profiling would start with a trigger, a certain trigger that is pre-configured. And uh, once the trigger has stopped, uh, that would stop the recording and all the data will be profiled inside this ComTrade file that can be uploaded uh, and, and viewed for analysis. Statistical data comes as an obvious application for AC monitoring. Basically, if you're monitoring an AC value, you want to know what's the min, max in, a, in an interval, what's the mean value, and this will help you understand uh, how your AC profiling is taking place, and, and uh, maybe it will help you in setting up certain parameters in your primary equipment that will allow the AC uh, values to be to give you a better performance and less loss in your uh, substation more efficient running of your substation um, digital fault recording is uh, a standalone there is digital standalone digital fault recorders in your substation that constantly record uh, values now it could be also a standalone application inside your concentrator and uh, it, it would provide an effective uh, way to accurately record and analyze substation events uh, while avoiding the excessive added cost of a digital fault recorder um, the the this scalable application would accommodate virtually any number of analog or digital channels uh, by employing peer-to-peer -peer communication and uh, cross-triggering uh, a set of uh, IEDs. Uh, this allows you to collect a full set of data uh, on, uh, on the condition of your uh, network. Um, so through HMI, you can collect this uh, information, this digital fault recording, and then you can view uh, the digital faults that is uh, being recorded based on a certain trigger and uh, would allow you to understand why faults are taking place, what triggered the faults, and what were the different uh, sets of different values, uh, states in every IED in your uh, substation when the fault took place. Um, so we have discussed the statistical data. Power quality data has to do with the swells, 
sags and interruptions um, this data is uh, related to the root mean square uh, voltage profiling and uh, is recorded again in a comtrade file that can be viewed using any comtrade uh, viewer um, so um, this is uh, how we measure power quality for ac monitoring is using the sags swells and interruptions Supplementary AC data is data that uh, we are interested in uh, when we're monitoring AC data, for example, the voltage and current. So we can calculate the line to line voltages and phase angles from line to neutral uh, voltages and uh, phase angles. And we can calculate the neutral current and uh, phase angle from phase current and angles. And uh, the data will be used for further analysis uh, by operators. Uh, TDM or thermal demand metering applications uh, are used for by utilities that require the ability to record power demand uh, for calculating the equivalent of a thermal state of an electromechanical uh, meter. Uh, the peak demand value is also calculated. So it's basically the thermal state and the peak thermal demand are calculated stored in the concentrator for other applications that will take pick up these values and do analysis on it. Most of the AC monitoring that we've seen so far would calc would bring data. This data would be recorded, but it's most some of it is important instantaneous data, what we call as operational data, and some of it is uninstantaneous data records that the engineer needs to go to site and uh, pick up over a com trade file and then use this com trade file to analyze the status of the substation or the status of the loading in the substation over a period of time so that's non operational data operational data is normally you hear operational non operational all the time when we're talking about the data in a substation a non operational data is data that we pick in a in a file over a period of time that doesn't require instantaneous uh, um, actions yet operational data is what the operator is acting on instantaneously that's why we call this operational data so a breaker status is an operational data right so when the breaker is closed or open that that's like a little square that's in the front of the operator that turns to green or red right so that's what operational data now operational data because it's instantaneous when we say the word instantaneous it's not like in the protection world instantaneous in automation world instantaneous is in seconds it's not in milliseconds so the data getting from the substation to the operator who's sitting in the management system whether it's a, a distribution management system dms or ems as we mentioned previously would take the action on operational data non-operational data is picked up by an engineer and used later for further analysis of the state the overall status like like we said in the ac monitoring right you're taking the max and the min and the rms and the uh, the sags and the swells over a period of time and you go well you know what maybe my power factor is not perfect in here and maybe i can achieve a better power factor so this is what ac monitoring is all about is to achieve a lot of non-operational data that will help you over time to take decisions nevertheless some of the data is still instantaneous communication is a big deal in the world of uh, substation so communication monitoring statistics is very important for substation operators uh, basically uh, if i want to summarize all the communication uh, applications very quickly uh, a communication watchdog or a communication uh, monitoring application uh, basically raises an alarm when communication is lost between the main concentrator and one of the IEDs or two IEDs lost communication with each other in the substation and the remote operator wants to know about that status so uh, he, he receives that status via a digital input that is an alarm that tells you know one of the communications is lost do you want to is it critical do you want to take uh, uh, action on it. 
if we dispatch somebody to the substation to do maintenance, uh, you might want to have a substation maintenance communication application. Basically, this communication application would put the substation concentrator in a maintenance mode where it is delivering the last recorded value for all the inputs. So whenever the operator is asking for the values, he doesn't get alerted because there is a maintenance that caused a certain uh, value that's abnormal uh, for any reason, he's always receiving the last normal value in the substation, or you could put it in maintenance and say always report the normal value and preset the normal values that's going to be reported to the operator. This way the operator wouldn't be get alerted for no reason when the substation is in maintenance mode. A virtual terminal application is a common application in the substation. This is where the remote engineer or the remote operator wants to communicate to one of the devices that sub to the concentrator. And it's as if there is a virtual uh, wire. Your, your concentrator becomes like a virtual wire where the engineer could turn one application at his end and that application would seamlessly talk to a very remote uh, primary equipment or an equipment close to the primary equipment without noticing that there is a multiplexer, there is all of these devices in the middle between that application and the end IED. So the application would uh, operate as if it is connected directly to the IED even though there is so much equipment in between. So that's what a virtual terminal or what we call a pass-through application is. Land services. Uh, land services uh, has to do with um, all the land related, Ethernet related uh, operations. Uh, so, so you could be having multiple channels, multiple communication channels, and and that's that's uh, important for land from a land services to know how many lands, uh, how many times you had a crash on your network, was the network overloaded, uh, was it loaded to the point that you couldn't send and receive data. All of this is captured in a land communication monitoring. Uh, com statistics for serial communication, uh, how many. Uh, uh, proper polling was received. How many failures on polling did we lose? How many messages were corrupted uh, due to noise? Um, all of these statistics is important for communication. Um, one of the important uh, data that gets communicated in a substation is uh, time. Uh, so, so the same way that you have a time on your wrist that basically keeps telling you the time and uh, keeps uh, you keep adjusting to that time. So now it's lunch time. So I gotta go take lunch. Uh, uh, basically, the 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 time uh, device in the in the substation it receives the time from from. Uh, the satellites and then distributes the time in the substation. How it distributes the time in the substation, there is many, uh, many ways that it can do that. So it's either IRIC B, which is one protocol for distributing the time over two, two wires uh, all over the substation, uh, simple network time protocol, uh, hop protocol, Oh, there is many other uh, protocols that will allow you to receive the time from the satellite and then uh, send the time. And each protocol has its own um, characteristics and uh, data layout, whether it's seconds, milliseconds, uh, granularity, and, and uh, how does it encode and decode. So now there is a whole uh, emphasis on security and how how we make sure that that time is not corrupted in any way, shape, or form. Um, you might have annunciators in your substation. Uh, so when the when the dispatcher uh, sends uh, uh, an engineer to the site, he comes and he can locate the issue without going through and connecting. Uh, a device or connecting his laptop to a device in order to find out what's the alarms. This annunciator would be like a panel uh, with little illuminating windows that would turn on in order to indicate a certain alarm that will assist the field personnel in immediately locating the alarm in the substation and going directly to the point of uh, failure or the point of the alarm and try to service it uh, much faster. All of it has to do with trying to make sure that the communication is perfect, trying to make sure that we have instantaneous access to data, no loss of communication, and uh, efficient usage of our communication medium. 
when changes happen in our substation, we would like to log this data. So data logging, storage, and historical data is important. Uh, so so the, all of that will help us in trying to learn about non-operational data and try to uh, do some analysis on our substation st stability. Uh, SOE local logger, some uh, substation uh, utilities uh, might have a philosophy that they would like to keep a copy of their sequence of events. The difference, again, the difference which we mentioned before, the difference between a sequence of event and a change of state, a change of state is a mere record that tells you there is a state that changed from zero to one. So that might be an instantaneous message that's an operational data that goes back to the operator to act upon. And SOE is a sequence of event with a time so that that's how you put it in a sequence because it has time in it, right? So that the time gives you the sequence of uh, events that took place in your substation. And as such, you want to put it, log it in a historian uh, as such historical analog data and historical digital data can be used from a historian uh, to be analyzed against any event that took place in your substation. And uh, Depending on your utility philosophy, uh, the utility might say, I would like all of these events to be printed so that if there is a seismic uh, uh, issue, if there is uh, any other issue that impacted physically the substation, that I don't lose this data. I still have uh, the printed paper of this data. And uh, when you are in old substations, you will see those nine pin printers that are constantly running, printing every sequence of event. Um, Another sub, uh, utility might say, well, no, we would like this data to be in files and we will retrieve these files from the storages using FTP, right? So previously we talked about network services. So one of the network services will be file transfer protocol, um, uh, uh, FTP or trivial file transfer protocol, TFTP, that would take this file and constantly store it on a local PC uh, which is a historian or a local HMI that the, the engineer can go every now and then to the substation and look at this data. Now, if you're dealing with uh, accumulators or counters, you might want to freeze these accumulators every period of time and take a, 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 a value in, in a, at a certain time. So maybe every second, every two seconds, you're freezing those accumulators and reading the value. Um, an example of accumulation is how many times did you have tripping in your substation for a certain breaker, right? Or and, uh, and this data is important because the breaker can take so many before it has to be changed. Uh, all of that plays, uh, plays into, uh, uh, into analyzing non-operational data, um, event storage and backup. So you might wanna have the data printed at the same time on a file right, that you can retrieve remotely. And if you can't retrieve it remotely, at least you can come to the substation and look at the data locally and pick it up from the local PC. If you can't pick it up from the local PC, it's printed, so that's redundancy of data logging. So with all the primary equipment, we've got a lot of data. Now, how do we report this data in a summarized and re uh, reduce that data to the, to the operator? Because the operator cannot receive an avalanche of data right and act on it so he would like all the alarms in the database in, in the from the primary equipment to be categorized so you have a primary alarm a secondary alarm so if this is if this is a substation alarm number one what will happen is that doesn't matter if the, even if it's three o'clock in the morning he's going to wake up the engineer and send him to the substation because that alarm could be a high high temperature alarm which means that the um, the transformer might be on fire or something something bad happened inside the substation um, so uh, analog reference if your analogs lose their references right that means that the data cannot be trusted right so it has to have proper measurement uh, proper reference to measure ag against. Uh, whenever a data change, uh, we a data change detect application would would detect that, that the data have changed and report the data. Alarm prioritization. Um, so is the alarm important? Is it not important? Alarm uh, analog averaging. So do you really want to hear every time your analog chatter, or do you want to hear an average of your analog value as an operator? Uh, analog alarm. So you would you would take. Uh, uh, you will take an alarm 
from an analog value if it stays above a certain limit for a certain period of time. So there is something called chatter, which means that analog will go above a certain limit, but will come back quickly. Now that's chatter, and that's common in a substation. That's not important data. But if it goes above a certain limit and sustains above that certain limit for a long time, right? Uh, that that time, history time is is very important to report an alarm back to the operators to tell them, look, there is an analog that went above or under a certain limit and it stayed under that limit or stayed above that limit for a sustained time that we would have to inform you in a, uh, in a uh, digital input alarm, for example. So that's an analog alarm. Uh, you might want to do an, uh, an averaging at the top of the hour, top of the minute, top of the second. Um, and then the redundant I.O. Uh, redundancy is a big thing in our substations and sometimes you want to take a source of data and split it into two reporting to two separate, uh, to two separate uh, um, target uh, concentrators uh, because if one concentrator is down then you can pick up the information from the second concentrator so a redundancy can become really expensive it's it's one of these areas where you have to balance cost versus uh, tolerance of uh, failure or tolerance of not having the data at the uh, management system uh, digital input debounce so again uh, like the analog a debounce it means uh, let's say you've got a chattering input which the input is constantly changing. Well, if that input changes to an on and that's an alarm, right? Is that something that we immediately should report to the operator? Or maybe we should wait a certain time before checking on that digital input and if it came back to an off value, then that's fine. Or if, if that value is normally off, or if that value is normally on, then how long should we wait before checking in on it again because we, we have, a, we have a, a changing in that digital input. So again, it's all about how we don't send an avalanche of data to the operator so that the operator can make a logical and informative decision instead of making an informative, an uninformative decision or a bad decision could cause an engineer to go to the substation and ignore other important alarms, right, for no reason. So that's a waste of engineering hours, right? It could uh, raise an alarm <clears throat> in a utility, a false alarm. And those are really expensive alarms. So that's something you want to avoid. So there is a lot of applications, automation applications that are implemented, uh, for example, oring all your data or ending all your data and making sure that you or and you measure the debounce and you measure the data uh, from an averaging point of view and uh, redundancy of data so you would trust the data from you would take the data from two sources and if if they're equal it means it's trusted data that all plays uh, a role inside your substation in the substation automation the more intelligent uh, your data reporting the more intelligent is are your operators decisions so one of the common situations that we find ourselves in a substation is we want to convert the data so for example you've got a sensor that's measuring the data in degrees Kelvin and you want to change it to degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius, right? Uh, that's a primary sensor, right? And then you have to figure out that, that calculation. In order to do the calculation, you found yourself in a situation where you've got to take an analog value and convert it to a digital value. Or you've got a digital value and you've got, got to convert it to an analog uh, value. Or you've got an input, a digital input, and you want to change that digital input into a digital output. So you've got to act on that digital input and change it into a digital output. For example, you've got two remote masters and you want the input of one master or the digital input that's sent from one master to translate into an output to the other master, right? A good example is what we call a mailbox, right? where the, the substation is acting as a mailbox between two remote masters. Uh, let's say one is a transmission, one is a distribution, and they want to tell each other that, look, I've got control. So the transmission will send a digital input to the substation that's picked as a digital output to the, to the other master, telling the other master, look, 
you're not in control of uh, these points and now uh, the, the transmission uh, the transmission uh, uh, management system is in control um, so uh, time stamping so and how you change the time from days to hours to seconds right depending on the resolution that you want on the time um, all of these conversions can be uh, can be very cumbersome and very time consuming if it's not done inside the automation system and saving that uh, load of computation from doing it at the management system uh, so that's another application of automation in your substation um, with all of these applications I hope you have a good understanding uh, of why substation automation is such uh, an important field and such a great uh, field to explore and learn about um, data transmission is is very important very critical for the life of our uh, substation very critical to the operators and the engineers and uh, maintaining data uh, communication is a very important task in uh, communication so uh, hopefully that uh, you can uh, you have an appreciation for that if you have taken this course as uh, part of a program at GE and you have to carry out a test at this point you know feel free to take out your test and hope you pass it um, if, if you're just attending uh, this training uh, to, to gain, gain more knowledge hopefully I, I managed to uh, to reach to your expectations uh, hope to see you in a future learning modules with GE thank you